Hey everybody, welcome to the Ongaku Concept Podcast. I'm here with Gim, who is a... I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Hello everybody, my name is Gim, and I am a music theorist. I run a channel on YouTube called Music Theory with Gim, where I talk about mostly works from the common practice period, as well as like retro video game music. And that's pretty much it. This is unrelated, but would you would you say that there's such a thing as a common practice period of video game music? Um, because it's like there's a period of time in the early days of video game music where the hardware limitations kind of forced composers to work in certain ways, and I think that may have developed sort of a. This is way off topic from what we're gonna <laughs> what we're gonna be talking. It's not entirely because whatever, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you think something like that makes sense? Um. Yeah. Absolutely. So for me, because I could see you as being like a a, a a a scholar of the common practice period of both uh, art music and video game music. Yeah, I've never really thought about it like that, but I think that's would end up being kind of kind of what I would fall under. But uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, I definitely, I think that like right now, just because of technology and um, which before I go any further, this is by no means me saying like, oh, the old music is so much better. But um, <laughs> I do think that like right now, just because of technology and how um, video game consoles and stuff can can run music differently, is we are hearing more kind of film esque music, and the mm-hmm. barrier between like what is video game music, um, in the sense of like if some just like random person happened to walk by, and you were like, hey, can you guess if this is film music or video game music? It it probably wouldn't be able to tell um, in a lot mm-hmm. of instances, and uh, the um, I, like a. I mean, it's still a big part of it is that we do have, like, looping music, which Mm -hmm. isn't really part of film music. um, Yeah. Since it's set to a, like, you know, designated amount of time. But, uh, yeah, in the early days, it's it's really interesting. And um, which for me is, the early days for me is NES music. And um, it's like you hear, there are, like, very particular things about, about, about the music. Um, for instance, a lot of times you'll, you'll find things that if you try to kind of pinpoint the harmony in like a triadic sense, it ends up being really hard to do so without kind of mm-hmm. taking liberties just because, um, just the way they like used voices, it, it was almost, um, in a way kind of like how in like early modal music, like pre Baroque period, it wasn't, you weren't really concerned about harmony in the triadic sense of, of like chords the way we think of them today it's more of like melodies that had to be harmonious and uh a lot of nes music can kind of end up being like that uh like the metroid soundtrack has like a lot of uh, moments that are really hard to kind of define as like it's this chord um it leaves out a lot of information um and then also i think in that period you have like a lot of a lot of rock influences and you end up kind of hearing things that kind of go between its own sounds uh, kind of like common practice sounds because um, you did end up mm-hmm. with a lot of composers that were like pianists and uh, mm. um, and then you have like uh, like rock music was like a big deal so a lot of things end yeah. up being like power chord-esque and yeah. when you try to like impose a third on it it just sounds really weird like uh, mm-hmm. like the opening to Contra is I can't remember if they ever, I think they, it starts with like triadic chords, but then in the end, like it doesn't hit, it's just like uh, five chords at the end. And, mm. uh, and I went back and I was like, let me just see what it sounds like with thirds. And when I put them on there, it was just like, this is the most like awful thing I've ever heard. Just, it <laughs> doesn't sound right anymore. And, yeah. uh, so yeah. Um, well, I think that goes <clears throat> back to the, uh, the, I hate to use this word. The <laughs> the modal background of rock music. Yeah. Because rock music has, and if you take that back to folk music, has its roots in 
the uh, Gregorian modes from medieval times, and where classical music took Ionian and Aeolian, which are best suited to triadic harmony, and developed the harmony from there, uh, it's not that you can't do that with the other modes, because you can, Mm -hmm. but they aren't quite as well suited to it. And so the way that harmony developed for those is different. And one of the... uh, So the, the way that guitarists... I say guitarists specifically because of they're usually the uh, driving the harmony in rock music, uh, and that's where the power chord kind of comes from. Uh, we'll approach it is like, at least as a guitarist myself, and most guitarists who that I know tend to work this way, don't really think of power chords as chords exactly, but just as like really big notes. Yeah. Um, and you're writing melodies. It's, it's, they're melodies that fit together and you have the lower ones, which are really thick and you ha- you double them at the fifth, you harmonize them at the fifth to uh, make them bigger and make them, you know, and build up that foundation. And then you have a melody on top of it, which is the vocal melody or, or whatever. But it's, it's a sort of contrapuntal writing mm-hmm. that's not triadic harmony in the sense that we think of it today. Yeah. And so I can see how that would... How trying to stack and add thirds onto a song like the one that you mentioned uh, would go very wrong, because it's not... The motion's not written that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's and it's it's kind of also too like um, there's another contra tune. I think it's um, like the first level theme, like the I think it's like Jungle Hanger or something like that. Um, the there's like a point where it's mostly like if you're gonna if you like felt really compelled to slap a mode on it, it would be um, like predominantly Dorian esque. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, Dorian's by far the most common as far as rock music yeah. goes. Yeah, and um, but what's cool is uh, you'll see moments where they'll do these like parallel fourths um, and they'll do constant structures on them. And even mm-hmm. when it goes against the like, you know, quote unquote quality of the mode and that it has like a major third for that brief moment, it's like, it doesn't matter because it's like the idea is more important than like right. s- sticking to a particular like pitch set. And um but it, but at the same time as like that brief moment of um, of of hearing the major third doesn't suddenly put it into like a major sound or anything mm-hmm. and and I think like with theory a lot of times we we get too focused on like isolating things mm-hmm. and that, and that's why like so I, I like I I um, am part of like some music theory groups um, which uh, which by the way if um, if anyone cares. I did recently start a uh, a music theory group on Facebook that's like exclusively for like intermediate to advanced stuff. Um, that's exciting, and uh, it welcomes like any styles. Um, it's still really small, um, but it will be like monitored in the sense of it's going to make sure that everything is intermediate or above, and that's mm-hmm. not you know at all in the sense of uh, like oh, your question's not good enough. It's just not the place, mm-hmm. you know? Like, you wouldn't walk into, yeah. like, a fourth-year class asking first-year questions. Um, mm-hmm. it, could be, it could be a great question. It's just not the place, you know? Yeah, you're, um, you're trying to have a more focused yeah. discussion about yeah. a certain level of theory. Yeah, and that's just because usually whenever you have, like, music theory groups that are young or, like, small, they'll tend to have, like, really interesting discussions, like, for kind of, like, like or really just more headier kind of discussions, uh, mm-hmm. Just because, you know, I, I guess it's in a sense that like the more popular things become just the greater influx of, I don't know, I guess just, I don't know how to phrase it other than being like lower leveled kind of um, people just because, especially with music theory being such a specialized thing, like you, tons mm-hmm. of musicians don't even want to care <laughs> care about uh, music theory. So, right, um, right. But, uh, but yeah, so if anyone wants to, to check that out, it's a uh, music theory two like roman numerals and 
intermediate and advanced. And you just send in a request and you'll get approved. Um, and even if you don't feel like you are at that level, um, I definitely encourage you to still jump in and just look at things. Um, cause there's already some people on the list that, you know, have, uh, PhDs or professors and then retired, um, you know, like some really kind of inspiring, uh, people to check out and you might just come across terms that you've never heard of. And then thanks to the internet, you can look them up. And, uh, <laughs> I know for me, like a huge part of my learning wasn't really in the classroom, but, uh, like in university, but was more so of just like coming across like random terms online and being like, yeah, huh? Same. And Absolutely. Just like Googling it. And then you'll be like, there's not a Wikipedia article for this. This must be awesome. <laughs> you know? Like, um, so yeah. And, and there are tons of things like, I remember being, um, like 14 or so. And, uh, I think just like I kept coming across the idea of counterpoint and, uh, mm -hmm. they would, um, you know, recommend the standard of, uh, of Fuchs and, uh, it'd be like, um, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get that book. And then I got it and it was just like totally over my head at the time. So it was, yeah. it was just like, well, but then I had it, you know, and I came back to later. And, uh, I guess the point with that is that what's cool about music and I guess like with life in general is that, you know, if you come across something that you're not ready to understand, you can kind of like put it in your back pocket until you're ready to understand it. And, you know, other times you might come across things where you understand like what the idea is communicating and, uh, mm -hmm. you just don't agree with it. And you might find like years later, you're like, Oh, I, I don't know why, but now I get it. I get mm -hmm. exactly where it's coming from or at least where I perceive where it's coming from. And like, I fully embrace this idea. I know that's happened like with me, like for instance, like the credential six, four, um, mm -hmm. and the whole debate of like, is it a one, six, four, or is it a five, six, four, um, mm. for, for a long time I took like a neutral position. I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna call it a credential six, four. I don't have to worry about any yeah. of it. And, uh, I was more on the one, six, four side. And, uh, then there's just a moment where it clicked. And for me now, um, if it's used as an actual like credential six, four, then I hear it as a five, six, four. Um, and very rarely will I hear it as like a one, six, four. But if it's not mm -hmm. used in that manner, and this has to do more with just like than just harmony, but also uh, the context. That it's yeah, in. absolutely. And also, and that in context doesn't just mean like what directly comes before it or what's going to come after it, but also to like just like structurally in the form. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like is you can feel those things like subconsciously. You know, just because of yeah. like the way we're nurtured. You know, um, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah, if it if it doesn't feel like a five six four, then I'm not gonna like force it to be a five, six, four. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's a really long plug for, <laughs> <laughs> for, for a Facebook group. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to join it, you know, feel free. Um, I'll put a link to that in the description. Cool. Cool. Um, um, so I wanted to, the reason why I've got you on is because I wanted to talk about an exchange that we had, uh, on a Twitter thread uh, semi-recently. So I made a tweet um, about a chord that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, I've talked about it on this channel in the past, uh, which I've called the Blackadder chord. That was kind of a joke name that I gave it. Uh, it's, it's an augmented chord. It's an augmented seventh chord in the third inversion. Uh, it doesn't really function like that. Uh, I will, I'm not going to explain that right now, but I will put a link to that uh, in the description. You can take a look at that if you would like. Um, and I was going over some of the, in that thread, I was going over some of the specifics as to how I prefer to approach uh, labeling it and uh, writing it down on a score. And one of the things I wanted to avoid was, so being, uh, it's, the upper structure of the chord is an augmented chord, and then you have a bass note that's not, it's a non-chord tone. If, due to the way the chord is structured, you can either, so for example, A flat augmented over G flat. That would be the kind of the 
In the key of C, that would be kind of be the prototypical example, um, is what you will find most often. Uh, you could write the A flat as G sharp. Generally, the uh, G flat will move down to F, and the A flat or G sharp will move up to A. Sometimes, sometimes it because usually it's headed to an F major chord. Uh, if you're going to an F minor chord or whatever minor chord a semitone below, uh, the A flat may just remain A flat. And so, I had two reasons for. I, I'm bouncing all over the place, but. <laughs> Um, I wanted to avoid using both accidentals at once. So I didn't want to have G sharp and G flat in the same chord. And one reason for that was, and I thought for a very long time about this, but, uh, and it, I didn't think it was an ideal solution exactly, but I, one of my reasonings was that I didn't want there to be any octave confusion. It's one thing if you've got them like really clearly separated and there's only one instance of each note in the chord, but if you've got some sort of arpeggio going on, uh, I thought that there might it might be difficult to uh, when you're sight reading it to discern quickly between the G flat and the G sharp, uh, and that could get confusing. The other reason was because uh, in instances where it doesn't actually move up a semitone. So, for instance, uh, if A flat over augmented over G flat was to go to F minor instead of F major, uh, the A flat would remain A flat. It wouldn't be going upwards. And so going G sharp to A flat would be, to me, would be a bit strange. Absolutely. Um, now, there's that's taking the idea that there is a single way of notate, of spelling this chord that I wanted to stick to. Um, which in the case of A flat augmented over G flat, it's exactly what you would expect. G flat is on the bass, then you have A flat, C, and uh, E in the upper part of the chord. And I wanted there to be some sort of consistency among spellings, and that's one of the reasons, too, why I gave it that criteria, because I wanted there to, even though A flat to A is a little bit weird, uh, at least a flat to A flat and A flat to A to me was better than G sharp to A and G sharp to A flat. If we're trying to keep a consistent naming scheme and spelling scheme, um, so you were saying that at least in that particular case where it actually is moving up a semitone, that you would prefer to see G sharp. Yeah. Moving up. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and that's and that's partly. So if I see a flat to a, like I can, mm -hmm. um, I'm fine with it. Like I'm not gonna rage over like seeing that. But um, mm -hmm. if in an ideal scenario, it's like we could use G sharp instead of a flat. And um, you know, based on what you were saying uh, just now, makes me think of you know what's referred to as the German augmented sixth, and that when it resolves or not resolves, but kind of progresses to. The, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I don't remember if I actually said this or not, but I was, in this Twitter thread, I was referring to this chord as a Japanese augmented sixth chord. Um, so, yes, there's a there's a relation there. Oh, Anyways, yeah, go yeah. On. Um, and, uh, but uh, whenever it progresses to the uh, the cadential six four that's major, mm -hmm. you end up, um, it's it's kind of, now considered good practice to at least theorize it as a doubly augmented fourth chord, meaning that like the fifth is of the uh, the German augmented sixth chord is respelled as a uh, doubly augmented fourth. <clears throat> so like okay. if we have you know in the key of C the expected place for a um, an augmented sixth would be would be A flat, and so A flat. Instead of being spelled as uh, A flat C E flat, and then um, F sharp the, with the augmented sixth, <clears throat> is you would have it as A flat C D, um, and uh, I'm sorry uh, D sharp not D so A flat C D sharp and then F sharp, and that's because D sharp is going to move up to E 
whenever yeah. you have like the five, six, four. And not. Yeah. And, but with, uh, with that, is it, it's not like a, I don't know how they, how they deal with it in classroom settings, but, uh, in most books, it'll kind of be like, use your own discretion in terms of like, mm-hmm. do you, um, and like label it as this or write it as this or not. Cause if you look at a bunch of Chopin scores, you'll see that he wrote it as just a, a perfect fifth relative to the bass tone of the augmented uh, sixth chord. So, mm. you know, it's kind of like um, up in the air. But for me personally, like when I'm analyzing things, I like to really pay attention, not just from like chord to chord, but what the voices are doing. And yeah. so for instance, like with um, like the, the example you have on, on Twitter is by respelling it as uh, as E G sharp, um, it's easier to see how we have E G, E G sharp, and then F A, so that it's like this sort of parallel thirds motion, mm-hmm. um, rather than like a uh, you know minor third to diminished. So you fourth. have the parallel third, but you have the uh, constant. Uh, uh, sorry, the um, pedal above it. Right. Yeah, and that, and there's that too. Yeah. Um, and, and it, so it's like the, the third and fifth of C, E, and G moving to, uh, E and G sharp of A flat augmented over G flat and then F and A, the root and third of, of F. And so you just get this mm-hmm. kind of like nice line. And, right. uh, and then, so you can, you can also kind of see it in this particular case is if, if I was just going to analyze it, I would look at, um, that E and G sharp as being an embellishment of like the motion of C major to F major. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, and so a flat augmented is an inversion of C augmented. Yeah. And, um, and, and also just to like the way, like it, it ends up functioning of like, you know, there is like a strong root motion of C to F and, um, mm-hmm. and this is just kind of like embellishing that in this, you know, particular example that yeah. you have. There's, here. I put a link in later in this thread, uh, that I'm talking about, but there's an article, uh, on a website called soundquest.jp which is an extremely thorough analysis of the... It's one of the most thorough articles I've ever read uh, of this chord and different ways that you can look at it and how it might be applied. And one of the ways that the author uh, suggested looking at it, amongst others, was to think of it as you have your C chord and then you augment that then apply a tritone substitution to the bass only and not the rest of the chord. Um, and so that gives you C augmented over G flat. And that's that's what the chord is. And I, I prefer to think of it as A flat augmented over G flat, but it's, I mean, as an embellishment of C, which in a certain sense it is, uh, as you were saying that that would be one way of looking at it now i i I see um what you mean about so you're referring to well i'll let you speak for yourself uh can you explain why and i i think i understand why but can you explain why um you would prefer uh in less maybe in practical terms why you might prefer um G sharp to A flat in a, in a scenario like this. Um, so by practical, do you mean practical in the sense of of uh, reading, like, like sight reading or something? Oh, okay, so for sight reading, I, I absolutely not. I would not like view that as totally practical because there is that mm. like um, you have that uh, like cr- the cross relation of like G flat and G sharp, and you know unless unless it just becomes part of the repertoire and that standard is set like so heavily, then it ends up being, um, you know, if when people come across, they're just going to be like, what, what is this? You know? Mm -hmm. And it isn't until you stop and like, think about what things are doing, um, that, uh, that it it clicks and you're like, okay, I get it. Like I get why there's G flat in the bass and I get why there's G sharp in, uh, in, in uh, like an upper voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, in a, a large part of that just has to do with, you know, the way, so like the way we're, at least in the, in the West, like the way we're raised to think about 
music is uh, tends to be very harmonic. And when we think about harmony, it's, it tends to be very like in a very tertian format. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, so we, we tend to think of things in thirds. And when you start breaking that apart. So vertically instead of horizontally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, in vertical thirds. And uh, and even when we organize things as we somehow find a way to relate it like back to being tertian in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and like with that, the, <clears throat> the I'm trying to think out of phrases. Um, so like if I was to say like take C minor and I spell it instead of like C E flat G and I spell <laughs> it as like C D sharp G, um, mm-hmm. A is like people are going to be like questioning <laughs> the the validity of, of 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 like my my music theory but um mm-hmm. they'll also end up trying to relate it in some way as like uh they'll try to justify that augmented second as right. like some sort of either you know um like oh it's a sharp 9 but the third's just omitted or like c is the diminished seventh of d sharp and it's an inversion and g is just some random, yeah. anom- you know, like, it, like we, we struggle like <laughs> really hard right. to like kind of make things fit into our box of, of mm-hmm. like how we expect them to look. And, uh, that's kind of what I was going through with this chord when I first <clears throat> discovered it. And that's why I, it was what prompted me to come up with a new name for it. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and there's so many moments like in, especially when music gets really chromatic that, uh, you just have to like kind of compromise where you're like, mm-hmm. okay, if, if I spell this, this like motion uh, this way and I spell, but then I can't spell it this way to imply this information. And, and mm-hmm. so it just, it gets really like convoluted and you're just kind of like, you know what, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to say, forget it. And uh, if I can, yeah. if I'm not going to sit there and explain why I'm doing it this way, I'm just going to go with like convention, you know, um, mm-hmm. because otherwise it just leads to like crazy confusion. But uh, <clears throat> for instance, like, just to give a context of uh, of um, like C minor being respelled with D sharp instead of uh, E flat, um, the reason I would do that is in particular instances dealing with like chromatic mediants, um, mm. and uh, so I and I've been thinking about a lot of it recently because someone on on Twitter had like posted up the uh, Lion King's "Be Prepared," and I hadn't checked how Lion King music in like forever. And I mm-hmm. listened to it and was like, Ooh, this is a banger. And so like, <laughs> uh, it hits a chromatic median section. And so it's set in the tonality of a, with its uh, mode being minor. And mm-hmm. there's a, there's a part where it's like expanding the, the a minor s- sound. It's like prolonging it with C minor. And okay. in that particular instance, I would think of it as like C D sharp and G. Yeah. I see. I, I see what you're saying. Cause D sharp, I assume the next chord would be A minor. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so it's like a sharp four to five motion. Um, yeah, I see that. Which makes like a lot of a lot of sense in relation to uh to like A minor, which if that's what's being prolonged, like if A minor's the structural harmony, then I feel like at least and this is kind of uh leads into what I had what led to us like even like conversing on this uh on this post was that the idea of performance scores and analysis scores being like yes. different things. And, and uh, that, when you said that, that, uh, I'm sorry, finish your thought. Oh, well, I was just going to say in that like that allows, cause when you're performing, there's so many things that we do with a score to accommodate performance, which mm-hmm. makes total sense because that's, you know, usually how music is, is created and consumed and like, you know, most music is performed. It's not just sat there and like analyzed. Um, if you compare like the amount of theorists, I guess, to like performing musicians. Right. But um, we do a lot of things for those scores. Like we cram as many notes as we can on a page. We don't think of mm-hmm. like um, the systems, you know, being uh, separated in a way that communicates like structure and form. You know, like for instance, say you have uh, like a compound period with like two sentences and you might find that it's broken in like Right, and let's also say it's like prototypical eight measures, eight measures per sentence. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you might find that it's like six measures, six measures, four measures, two measures, or some like you know thing where per when system. You, yeah, and when you look at it, you you don't immediately see like the structural relation to everything. 
Mm-hmm. And like whenever I'm preparing scores that aren't being performed, like that's how I want to view things. I want to view things in, in the sense of like when I look at these two systems, I can not only read the notes, but I can kind of like just look at it at a glance and know what the expected form is or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And, you know, like if it was like a six measure phrase and I would try to put six measures together or whatever. And uh, mm-hmm. so that's one thing we do like with performance scores is we try to cram everything and save space and, um, and all that. And, uh, and then like dynamic markings are a really big deal for, um, for, for performance scores. And which not to imply that dynamic markings are not part of like analysis like they definitely are, but at the same time as like we're in a modern age where like we can listen to the music and not just like look at the score. And also too is like scores were notated with like markings based on like convention at the time. So sometimes like phrasing isn't even the same as what you would see on the score. Um, but uh, but anyways, the the point being is that like that kind of clutters up the space for analysis. Like if you have like phrase markings and you're trying to do you know, something where you're like connecting notes across measures or whatever and like drawing lines and stuff, it can get really messy because you have all these dots, all of these like, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, accent marks, different things like that. And uh, and I just, for me, I, f- I find it like clutters it up. And so, um, but in relation to what we're, you know, again, talking about is we also, the biggest thing is that we sacrifice, not sacrifice, but we essentially try to optimize uh, sight reading for the sake of like, the score. Um, right. Or for the sake of the performing the score. And so when, if I can interrupt you for a mm-hmm. moment, uh, when you mentioned that analysis scores versus performance scores, that uh, a light bulb kind of came on in my head when you mentioned that um, because I, I hadn't consciously thought of that distinction before you said that. But when you did, I realized that that was something that I, that that was a um, struggle, I guess, that I dealt, that I've dealt with continuously since I started making scores and still do, Mm -hmm. uh, which shows itself in all kinds of different ways. And one one of the things uh, that I, that's eternally frustrating is the, as you brought up, how many bars to put in a system. (laughs) <laughs> um, for, for readability and for, uh, analysis. And I try to make my scores, uh, as equally efficient for both of those purposes as possible, mm-hmm. but it's not always, you can't always win with that. Yeah. But like, I mean... When, so one of the things that comes to my mind when I think about that is I've got a, um, a guitar tab book of journey songs and Wait, is that, is that journey as in like the, like a uh, band oh, or like the, the, the band, game? the band. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and there's this one song, uh, which one was it? I can't remember, but there was a there was a part where the guitarist was uh, playing an E power chord, and he was alternating between. So you have like the root uh, fifth and the octave, and he was alternating between the octave and the seventh, and just as an embellishment of the of the chord, and so the um, the score had chord names above the uh, score. And it was labeling it like E5, E5 <laughs> major 7, or sorry, E major 7, no 3rd, <laughs> E5, whatever. And like that was really frustrating to me <laughs> trying to learn it, you know, yeah. <laughs> back back when I was doing it. Because I didn't understand how to, this was several years ago, I didn't really understand how to process this stuff. I, I could read the tabs, but I couldn't, right. like, I could read chord charts too, but like I, reading that was convoluted. Yeah, I and, imagine and that was like, very cluttered too. Oh yeah, it's, it, honestly, it was an awful scorebook. <laughs> um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have the uh, perspective to see that at the time, but right. like, but 
it was that was a case where the um the chord names were trying to do the job of the score. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've found. And because to me, I would just write that entire section with just a, an E yeah. chord about yeah. it, you know? Um, like and, as in like an E major chord? Or, right, right. So yeah. so if you recall, was it actually like implying like a yeah, major it was, sound? it was absolutely E major. Oh, okay, okay. So overly convoluted chord names uh, or overly specific chord <laughs> names, I think, are yeah. something that I really... it. It really depends on the situation. Again, mm -hmm. it's performance versus analysis. So, for example, if you have a, if you're giving performers a chord chart and that's all that they're getting, um, and you have a really convoluted chord like an E seven sharp five sharp nine or something, and you really want that specific chord played, mm -hmm. like you're gonna have to write that down. Yeah. Um, if you're not gonna use a score, if you're resigned to not using a score, and if you're going to um. And you can you can find other ways to write a chord like that if you want to, but it, uh, then I can't think of examples off the top of my head. It would probably just be like alt. poly chords or whatever. Yeah, or, or um, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, you would have to write that out in the form of a chord uh, if you're going to be dealing with chord charts. But on a score, if I were to be replicating the, if, if let's say that that was performed and that was uh, and you have that recording, and let's say that. You were then you then you took the recording and transcribed it so that you had the specifics of everything that they played, um, and then, and this is not meant for performance. It's meant well it, in a sense it is. It's meant if you want to replicate the actual performances that they made, because they didn't plan out the performances, but they would have improvised them based on the progressions that more or less improvised them based on the chart that they were given. Uh, but you ha have this very high resolution level of detail on this score. And for that reason, I would then take the chord names and I would make them much lower resolution because they no longer need to communicate all that mm -hmm. information because the score is present. Yeah. And so instead of that E7 sharp 5 sharp 9, I would probably just put E7 mm -hmm. or something like that. Yep. Um, and so... All that to say, I've absolutely run into situations like that as well, where there's a uh, difference between what's expedient for performance and what's expedient for <clears throat> analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah, and what's... Yeah, so, like, with that in mind... Um, uh, it, so, like, t talking about, like, chord symbols and, and labels and, like, mm -hmm. having and having, like... So if you have a score in front of you... Um, you know, I, f I find this was something I learned like fairly recently, um, in the last like two years or so mm -hmm. where you shouldn't feel compelled to put a chord label on everything and that it's okay mm -hmm. for it not to be like a chord. Um, you know, even if it looks like a, a vertical voicing that you might instantly be like, Oh, it's gotta be a chord. It doesn't necessarily have to have like a chord symbol. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there are so many moments where, like, when you start using really convoluted uh, chord symbols, that it, it when you look at the chord symbol, at least for me, you you don't relate it to what it's actually functioning as. Um, mm -hmm. That you end up like losing trying it. trying to interpret it? it. Well, like, like for instance, like if it's like a, what they refer to now as like um, like a hybrid voice or yeah, hybrid voicing for like mm -hmm. when it's a um, when it's a slash chord. But in the bass, you have something that's not in the chord um, that it's stating. So, like C major over D, which can be viewed yeah. as like you know like a, a type of you know uh, like D D nine sus or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> um, like that's not really a good example because it's so common that I think most of us would yeah. see it and be I like, I mean, like that's that's D nine sus, but like it's written in a way that's more efficient to read right c over and d is way easier to process yeah but whenever it comes to like uh for me like when, when, with analyzing and again that wasn't a great example because of just how like common that voicing is <laughs> but like yeah. when you get to like the more c sharp over d yeah you know and it, it just it just kind of like clouds and and kind of like it just like obfuscates the the whole like point of what it is it's like is it mm -hmm. does it really these things or like is it is it just yeah. some, you know um, and another one that's kind of 
that I had to like really get over because of jazz school is uh, seeing notes and not assuming they're part of the chord um, mm-hmm. and not calling them like an extension. And that's like right. nowadays is like <laughs> it like immediately is like so irritating to to see something used as just an embellishment and it'd be called yeah. a chord tone. And yeah, you know, and I remember yeah, that's something I've that's that's also something that I've a transition that I've gone through as well yeah. over the past year or so. Um, I remember specifically in like my like last year of of uh, of of university, we had to do like these lead sheets that were like transcriptions, but they had to be written as lead sheets uh, for people to perform. And um, one of the like kind of suggestions that was kind of urged as almost being like you had to do it was that if like tones were in the melody, they should be implied like in the mm. in the chord symbol. And uh, and part of it is like, and I understand it. Like I understand like in, yeah. in like the jazz setting of it being like, because you play so many things other than like what's just written, and you take a lot of liberties with like your voicings and stuff. But at the same time, like even if you end up clashing, if you resolve it, it's not a big deal. But the problem is that like when you have a chart and you put like melodic tones in the chord symbol, and then it goes to like you know improvisation, like soloing or whatever, is like. <clears throat> But were those really part of like the harmony, like, w- or was it just yeah. an embellishment? Should that be considered part of like, you know, the the sort of, I guess like, uh, where the soloist like departs from and and, and right. thinks of like of things, um, and uh, yeah, and then you you know you look at stuff like, uh, um, I mean, a like Chopin or um, Beethoven, like there'll be so many moments where they play these like. If we were, <laughs> if we were gonna like put a jazz chord on it, it'd be like these like ridiculous chord symbols, uh-huh. um, just because uh, it's and it's just embellishments. And like when you listen to it, it's very clearly embellishments. Um, yeah. And you know, and, and and people like you know like like uh, like Charlie Parker or Bird would play like major sevenths on top of dominant seventh chords or major minor seventh <laughs> chords. And, but it's, it wasn't that it was like implying the presence of both sevenths and like this, like really far out weight. It's just like a, yeah. a, a, a chromatic neighbor tone or, or like, you know, it, it just intensifies that the root of that chord. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, Chopin does it. Uh, there's even like an instance where, uh, it's just like ridiculous moment and, um, a piece by uh, Schumann that's like, one of his leader, and uh, it's like a an F sharp half diminished chord, and like in the voicing you have E, um, in like the piano accompaniment, but then mm-hmm. the vocal like right as it hit it's like you hit that chord the vocalist sings an E sharp, and I think it's like even a minor second rub against one another, yeah, and it's just like this, it's a really fantastic moment because it's so like dense, mm-hmm. but at the same time it's not like oh this is a a half diminished yeah, major yeah, seventh, yeah. you know, like right. Um, it's it, F sharp diminished. Yeah, well, it, it is. It is like a half diminished. So there was mm-hmm. like the the seventh there, but yeah, it's just like there's no like crazy doubling of sevenths or whatever. You know, it's just right. it's just a brief moment. Um, and uh, but yeah, like I, f- I feel like we get way too caught up in that. And um, and another one that like you'll see very often in like the kind of more. Um, like when you're dealing with uh, like common practice period music, is you'll end up with <clears throat> the one of the funniest things with augmented sixth is like the whole like nationalistic uh, names. Um, oh, so like Italian sixth, French sixth. Yeah, and like German, and now we have Swiss, and I think there's like even another one that's trying to pop up. Not not Australian? not in reference to uh, the the Japanese sharp six, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but uh but I think like a, another one that's like uh, trying to be like a I think they were like it'll be referred to as like a, a virtual half diminished or something like that that's like using hmm. an augmented sixth with which I'm totally down with the concept of using augmented sixth chords on non uh, major minor seventh like in harmonics um, which is something that. I'd love to talk about on on my channel just in general because I think mm-hmm. I think we've like really confined the idea of what an augmented sixth can do, but uh, but the point of why I brought this up is that you'll see in scores where um, a uh, a composer will have a melody. Um, so say we're dealing with again in in the people's key of C, we have uh, <laughs> A flat augmented sixth, and um, we have uh, like the notes. <clears throat> 
um, like E flat D C. And let's just say that like in the accompaniment, it's just the voicing of what would be referred to as an Italian. Well, you'll see in mm-hmm. a, like analyses, they will literally put German augmented sixth, French augmented sixth, Italian augmented sixth. Even, like, and to me, that's just like so. Like, do we hear that? Do we hear it as like, wow, they mm-hmm. went through like these three different variations? Or was it just like a melody? And at the end of the day, it's just an augmented sixth chord. And do we really need yeah. to note? Like, it'd be kind of, to me, it's kind of like the Italian augmented sixth is kind of like saying, oh, it's, it's a dominant seventh, but with no fifth. You know, it's just right. like, do we really need to say that? Um, yeah, that or, makes sense. Or like, uh, for instance, like on, on, in like the jazz world, uh, when you have tritone subs, um, which are in like the basic manner, just essentially like augmented sixth chords, um, they, uh, you'll end up having, like, it's, it's usually understood that if a chord is functioning as like a tritone sub, that it has like a sharp 11th. Um, but you don't have to say that. And you wouldn't say like G flat seven, G flat seven, sharp 11, G flat seven, you know, like mm-hmm. it, it would just be G flat right. seven. And it's just understood that these extensions are like part of it, you know, um, and, and also, too, is, like, just extensions. It doesn't have to be necessarily a chordal extension, which is another big thing I'm currently kind of going through, is determining mm-hmm. what should be considered a chordal extension versus just, like, part of, like, the sound. Like, does it function as a chordal extension in, like, the kind of, like, the traditional so sense? By or, that, you mean, like, chord tones? Yeah, so, like, um, and also, too, is, for me, is, like, anytime you're analyzing music, you have to also kind of consider what, like, the standard practice is of like the music you're analyzing and, um, mm-hmm. and what period you're in. And, uh, but then you can also, of course, like just come to music with a completely like neutral mindset of just whatever you think of is what you think of. But, uh, the point being that chordal extensions being like, um, you know, like when you have like a seventh, um, a seventh can appear and be used, but is it, um, is it operating as like, is it operating harmonically, like leading, as like mm. part of the counterpoint or the the voice leading, and that like sevenths tend to you know uh, fall down, um, and so they can fall down in the same register. They can transfer to different registers, but um, if it, if it if it moves in a way that say it's like just part of the melody, right? And say say you have like and it's just an appoggiatura to the one or something like that. Yeah, or or even like if you have um, something like. Uh, like you have an, uh, the you're on the one chord of like C major and you're you have the note E, and then you go to the five chord and the melody is ascending like through F. So you have like F G and then it does whatever else. It's like is that and that's the only time like that F pops up. It's like is that really implying a seventh chord or is that just like a brief moment? Like does it really need right. to be part of the harmony? And um, <clears throat> and so that's like some different things. And same with like you know thirteenths, uh, sharp fifths flat 13, stuff like that. It's like looking at how they work. And then also too, another one being like, uh, for instance, like a big one's like flat 13 chords on a, like in, they, they often pop up as uh, in like the minor, um, the minor mode for, especially mm-hmm. for like earlier periods. And that um, they will usually resolve within themselves. Like it'll usually be either a suspension or it could just be like a, an incomplete neighbor tone or whatever. Um, and, uh, it'll just resolve within itself. So I wouldn't look at that as like a chordal extension that leads into like the next chord. I would, I wouldn't view right. it as necessarily being like, say a, uh, a G G seven flat 13, or like if a flat appears and it resolves within itself or within the chord, I wouldn't necessarily think of that as like a G seven flat nine, um, because it's not leading into like the next chord. And so in terms of analysis, I wouldn't view it as again, like part of the, the harmony but it's just like part of the, the counterpoint or just the embellishments or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not important enough to the to, to like that the progression. moment in time and to the progression yeah. that it's uh, placed within to it's it's a matter of asking yourself how essential this thing is to the music. Yeah. And um and for me is like especially with like a like nowadays with theory is it is I try to be as um, like I try, I try to think of it as like intensely as I can, but when it comes to like theorizing what's going on, I, I try to reduce it to like as little as you need to know what's mm-hmm. going on. Like what's the core sound 
and then everything else around it's just like an embellishment which for anyone familiar with like uh, more of like the the shanker style would be like yeah. you know reducing everything down to like a one five um, which is yeah. like what a large part of it is but it's I feel like that that comment gets like kind of like blown way out of proportion um, in the sense that uh, a lot of times when you're looking at it. It's not so much, it's like the, the, the core goal is that it's like just this. And, and I feel like a lot of people say like, oh, that just leaves out so many details and, and you, you know, you're like, um, you're just stripping it of all of its character. And it's like, yeah, but mm-hmm. it's understood that this is just the skeletal frame and right. that everything else is like elaborating this idea, you know? And, and when you look at the scores, you'll see that it's almost like different layers. So like, imagine if you have like, I guess it's kind of like you know, like with like with like with like Google Maps, you know, the further you zoom out, like the less detail there is, um, right? So that you're looking at just general ideas because you don't want to see all of that detail when you're just like, you know, looking at a, like countries next to one another, um, or right, like exactly. looking at states next to one another or whatever. You know, you don't need all that detail, but when you zoom in, then that detail starts to surface. Um, and so I feel like with analysis and then like analysis like scores is like that's kind of part of it too is is you're reducing it and um but also thinking of it like on a very technical manner but you don't have to label everything you can because the notes are there um and I I think that's like something that uh I know for me there was a time whenever I'd be like uh look at I would just like scan charts at like the chords like just the chord symbols and be like, mm-hmm. that's not that interesting of a chart because those chord symbols <laughs> don't look cool. And then I would mm-hmm. come back later when I like knew more and looked at it and be like, whoa, this is super hip. It's just all this stuff is happening that's not like in the chord symbol because the chord symbol is just like, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, but uh, you have to like look at the notes. And I feel like a lot of us, especially those of us that aren't like trained classically, like mm-hmm. from the time we're born, basically, um, is, uh, we, we tend to like, until we reach a certain point, we tend to avoid that. I know I did. I avoided reading yeah. music for like a really long time. Yeah. Um, and even when I started learning to like read music, I, I would still avoid it. And I would just try to like, look at the basic, you know, kind of, uh, like the, the chord symbols or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, um, music theory is really wild cause it's just perspective, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to ask yourself when you're making decisions like that for how you write something down or how you look at something, what are you trying to achieve? Yeah. And maybe you don't know that, and it, it takes a little bit to work that out, and so maybe there's some trial and error involved, yeah. which is fine, but like, eventually you have to, um, especially if you're preparing a score for somebody else to read, uh, or for yourself to read later, uh, you have to ask yourself, like, what is it that you're trying to do? Because certain decisions are going to uh, be more effective to that end than others. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, there, like, there's kind of, like... And that can be debated. Like, yeah. you can have people who disagree that, like, they, one person... For the same reason, like you can have, anyways, but, and that's fine, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, for what's worth, disagreements are, are totally fine. Um, and, and that's a big part of, of theory is you're going to run into people that um, perceive things very differently. And that's, that's great. I personally, like, I love that um, just because it's just, it's perspective again, you know, like some things it's like you literally have to change the way you hear in order to like understand the hearing or sorry, understand mm-hmm. the theory. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like that's a, a, like when you hear people talk about music theory, you often hear them talk about how like it's just rules or whatever. And that like, they'll always, there's always the comment of like, use your ears of, as if like when you learn music theory, you learn to like not use your ears, but every respectable book that I've ever read will at some point mention like, use your ears. So mm-hmm. I, it's just like this kind of like misinformation of, of like, of, I don't know, I guess it's like, it's like we try to, it's like we're trying to turn uh, music into the, like, just, just like uh, robotic data with like no 
when we're like trying to strip it of feeling or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's really not. Like honestly, the more I learn about music theory and like the more like I investigate music, the simpler things in music suddenly become so much more interesting because right. it's like, wow, you said all of this with like such simplicity that it really sings, you know, and yeah, and uh, like I, I know there was for like a. It's so much harder to me <laughs> to write a song that's. I wrote a song uh, on the last album that I did uh, called "Tea on a Rainy Day," and it's got it. Most of it's just a monophonic piece, mm-hmm. and there's another song on that album called "The Cat and the Sparrow," which is completely monophonic. It's just a melody that's hummed. And like those were the most difficult <laughs> out of everything else. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like so raw that you mm-hmm. know, and it, it's there, there's no like, like there's nothing to hide behind either when it's simple. Right. The fewer notes you use, the more weight they have. Mm-hmm. And, and if you have a million notes, like it's not to say that those notes aren't important, but if you lose one of them, it, depending on which one it is it's less, it will have less of an impact. Right, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. There are tons of, like, you know, passages in, in, like, Chopin's music where it's just, like, ridiculous embellishments, and if you removed a ton of them, it would still be, like, crazy, you know? It, it, it mm-hmm. wouldn't change, like, and not to undermine, you know, what he chose, right. but in terms of, like, the structure of the piece, it's not, like, drastically changed. Mm-hmm. Um and and what's interesting is like when you say uh, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but uh, I think you said the fewer notes you use, the more weight they have. Yes. Um, what's interesting is like so when I started getting into uh, so when I was in jazz school, it was all about like okay, now there are supposed to be seven notes in most modes, and sometimes there are eight, but let's find chords that can use like nine and ten and eleven, like you know, like just like <laughs> as as absurd of a density that you can, and you're like. I'm going to find the secret chord, you know, um, and, and, uh, didn't Patricia already do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, th- I think there's like, uh, oh man, there's, there's so many like bizarre chords that are just like, when you look at them, it, it's like, this isn't a chord. This is Tristan. Just, yeah. And uh, well, yeah, I mean, that one's like crazy just because of how many ways you can interpret it. But I think there's like, mm-hmm. what is like the Northern lights chord or something, that's like literally. I think it's like all of them stacked in like minor seconds or something. Um, mm. And uh, it's like if you want to go down a uh, the Wikipedia rabbit hole of just like random yeah. chord names, you know, click on yeah. like Petruska, and then you're like, I'll just scroll down to the related. But uh, <laughs> yeah. anyways, the um, but the point is that like for a really long time is like you know, I equated like value with, and it wasn't really conscious. It was just kind of like driven into you of of, mm-hmm. of like equating. The more notes you have, like the the cooler the chord is, like the hipper the sound it will be. And mm-hmm. um, but when I started getting into uh, to like chromatic medians, and in those kind of relationships, um, I found that the more notes you put on those chords, oftentimes it, it takes away the impact that they have. Like mm-hmm. it takes away the the relationship because you have even more common tones uh, when you have extended chords, or or at least like the opportunity to have more common tones. Mm-hmm. And when it's just like triads, it's it's so, like the 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 sound is so like, not like pure in the sense of like, it's impure to use, right? Extensions. It's just pure in the sense of like, it's like full force, closer um, to the essence of what it is. Yeah, and it's not dressed up. Yeah, and 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 also too is it's just because of. Um, because you have additional intervals created. Like, it's not just, you're not just adding, like, one note when you extend a chord. You're adding new, like, intervallic relations from, like, right. each of the notes. And those, you know, have an impact. It's kind of like, like, with, like, the major seventh chord, is you end up having two perfect fifths, depending on how you voice it. Yeah, yeah. And and that's, for me, I, I think is one reason why, you know, that sound is, you know, like, can often be referred to as, like, quote-unquote, like, heavenly um, or like uplifting because it's just, it's got two fifths in it, you know, it's so like smooth, mm-hmm. but even though it's got that dissonance of like a major seventh, which, mm-hmm. you know, like if you put it on like a minor chord, but it's balanced in a, yeah, within yeah, it. yeah. Um, so that's, it's a, it's a really, I don't know, it's, it's really interesting to the idea of, of like less is more 
But then at the same time, is you can turn around and have stuff that's super dense, and you're just like, this is the raddest thing ever. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, in stuff those, that would not work if it wasn't dense. Yeah, and but in those moments, it's not that it's not the density that is necessarily like the intriguing part. It's what they did with it. You know, it's mm-hmm. not density for the sake of density. Right. Um, and I think that's like something that we can get caught up in. You know, especially like, like when you're getting into you know, quote unquote modes and stuff. And you're like, Ooh, how many can I jam in like one song, <laughs> you know? And, and it's kind of like, okay, but like, what does that achieve? You know? Right. Um, so yeah. I mean, I mean, that can be fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like, absolutely. I, you can play games with music and have a lot of fun with those and like have a, you know, write a piece of music where you uh, transition between modes every like four bars or something like that. Yeah. Like, that's, that's fine. I, personally am not driven to write music with that with that sort of uh goal in mind but mm-hmm. like but there are certainly lots and lots of other ways to approach it that might be worth exploring if you aren't familiar with them yeah and and i definitely think um i for me I th- nowadays i think of modes more so as like because I think of, of everything now in terms of just, like, the chromatic scale, which before mm-hmm. I thought was, like, such a cop-out of people being like, it's just chromatic scale <laughs> mm-hmm. in terms of analyzing stuff. But now, like, like that's how I think of everything. I just think of mm-hmm. I think of everything being moments of, like, tension and release. And I don't really equate it to, like, scales. And that's why nowadays you'll, unless it's, unless it's very, very, like, strict of, like, this is definitely based on like the Dorian mode or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I will typically refer to things as either being in the major or the minor mode. Um, and that's just because hearing that sets up specific tendencies. Um, right. And in the sense that, like for instance, if you if you establish that you have the major mode, if you were to like say do like a strong like 5-1, um, if you were to play say like, from say like G seven and you're going back to the tonic, and you've never you've done you've not done anything to insinuate a change to to like the minor mode. Um, if mm-hmm. you play like say what looks like a major minor seventh voicing, to me when I hear that, unless it's done like very specifically, um, it ends up sounding not like a major minor seventh chord at all. It ends up sounding like a um, an embellished. Uh, or, or like a delayed resolution and that mm-hmm. B is a delayed resolution of C and then E flat's actually to me heard as D sharp and is a delayed yeah. resolution of E because like that mode is already established. Mm-hmm. And so that's only nowadays. So it takes a little only, more effort to, to solidify it as C minor. Yeah. And, um, and you know, same thing with like when you have, if you do, like what looks like a diminished seventh chord on like the one chord is it ends up sounding like just uh, embellishing tensions that can be referred to mm-hmm. as like just incomplete neighbor tones usually. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, instead and like of, on the one that's, I, I've heard in classical stuff, it's often referred to as a common tone diminished seventh. Usually the bass isn't on one, but. Yeah, yeah. So usually, and there's like kind of, it depends on who you're talking to in terms of like how it how it is written out. But um Normally, like with your common tone diminished seventh chords, you will try to spell them with the most like common tones used. So, mm-hmm. for instance, like on the one chord, you would have a sharp two diminished seven. So, for in C major, that would be D sharp diminished seven, and that's because C, the seventh of D sharp diminished seven, is like in the bass. D sharp is um, essentially a sharp two to three, uh, or D sharp to E, and then F sharp is a sharp four to five or F sharp to G. And then A is kind of up in the air. It can go down to yeah. G or do whatever. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, but on minor is you'll, I usually label them as like sharp four diminished chords, um, which mm-hmm. runs into like, uh, I would label it as like a sharp, sharp four diminished four three. Um, and so it, it's in second inversion. And uh, the, the problem running there is that the sharp four diminished seven is usually used for like the five chord to lead into it as its leading tone to miss seventh mm. chord. But in this case is the reason you do that is because now you have the common tone of the root of like the one chord. So C and then now you have the minor third because we're resolving to like a, the minor mode 
uh, tonic. And so we have E flat, which is the diminished seventh of F sharp diminished seven. And then you still have that F sharp to G, so a sharp four to five um, kind of resolution. Yeah. So, but, but like with those um, is, even though we refer to them as like common tone diminished seventh chords, there are a lot of theorists who are like, but they're not really chords. Um, hmm. And and for me that yeah I, I can see that I, I stand in like that kind of mentality of they're not really yeah. chords they're just uh, they are simultaneous tensions that it's like it's like a sus chord like sus four or something that's like it's not what would tip it's not like a triad or anything like that it's yeah um, it's something that's going to something else it's clearly going to something else yeah. And, 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 it, and that's also where like the whole like five, six, four versus one, six, four comes in as the idea of like, is it really the tonic chord? Is it functioning as that? Or is it really like tensions mm-hmm. against the five chord? Um, right. you know, so, uh, but what's, uh, yeah. And yeah, the, but I, I see what you mean about the chromatic scale because that's something that, that I also, uh, <clears throat> I also ended up analyzing most music that way. I've come back around from that to thinking of uh, major and minor and then a an overarching mm-hmm. chromatic scale. So I, I, I've come back around to reforming the major and minor uh, scales as primary classifications underneath that and, and you you kind of mentioned that anyways as like you'll classify music with a certain assuming that we're in a key with a given tonal center and then uh whether it's a major mode or a minor mode yeah. and that's also that's that's as far as i go as well i generally don't go any further with that but and sometimes i don't even say major or minor because it's yeah. not even like in a lot of rock music yeah I find that it, it, both are used interchangeably. Mm-hmm. Um, both thirds, I mean. Yeah, yeah. And which is really interesting. Uh, and that's well, I could go on a rabbit trail with that, but I, <laughs> I, I won't. Yeah. Um, by the way, have you ever? Are you familiar with uh, sectional tonality at all? I am not. You might want to check that out because uh, since it, um, from what I know, is like it seems like you're a really part of what you study is like rock based music mm-hmm. and, um, sectional tonality. It's not something that I'm very like well versed in. I understand the concept. Um, but the idea is that like, so in traditional, in the traditional sense, like modulation is like when we go to new tonalities, um, for like a really long time, to- like new tonalities are still related to the underlying like primary tonality. So these are like, they're all more like secondary tonalities. Like for instance, you know, like in a sonata form, you, you'll go to like the dominant okay, or yeah, you yeah, might yeah, go yeah. to like the, the, the mediant key in, if, uh, in like minor modes, so it's really common. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's understood that those departures are developing the overall end game kind of thing. Right. And, uh, and for instance, like there's, there are tons of, and this actually goes back to the analysis scores. Um, there are tons of times in music where you go these like really, really like deep rabbit holes of modulation that when you look back at them end up being like some sort of like pattern or there's, there's some sort of logic between all the modulations Mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, more often than not, especially like in in earlier period stuff is all of that was just a really, really long and super interesting way to basically get to the five chord at the end, um, to close Mm -hmm. it off. And so when you look back at all of it, you can relate it, um, to like it's just developing that underlying tonality and that's where like for me the chromatic scale idea comes in because uh <clears throat> you'll end up with uh lots of for me like there's terminology that i feel at first makes it easier to digest music but if you don't mm-hmm. get past that point it kind of locks it into this grid of being like for instance like secondary dominance um i'm not a huge fan of like that term anymore because really? and and the reason why is is uh because when when people say it it's understood typically it's understood as a reference to this is a dominant seventh chord um being pulled from that particular key so like if we're in the tonality mm-hmm. of c then like d7 would be like oh we've 
suddenly switch to G real quick and we're like we're doing a 5-1 relative to G. And for me, I prefer to think of it as um, emulation. Uh, I think of it as a dominant emulation and I think of sometimes even more specifically as a, as leading tone dominant emulation um, because also because I think we undermine the value of uh, non-leading tone dominance. But that's like a different topic. But anyways, like I think of like when the when when D appears to to lead into G that it's used as like an emphasis or like an intensifier. It's not like there's no moment where you like derail from C in like a prototypical sense. Like you you don't derail mm -hmm. from C. Like you're very clearly hearing C is still the tonality. It's never in question. But so it's like the if I'm understanding you correctly, you're referring to emulation in the sense that it's it's as though it's dressing up as something within this other key, but it's it's not it's not that other key. It's not from that other key. It's yeah. just yeah. acting in acting as though it were in the same maybe in the same sort of vein as there's a distinction between tonicization and modulation. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is that, and uh, and and I, I'm familiar with like ton tonicization, and and I get that, and uh, just for me personally, is like for some reason, is it, it just feels like it's it's implies too much mm -hmm. break from the underlying tonality. And, I can uh, see that, yeah. And and so, and also too is I think like we, like when we have like so when we think of like D, um, like D major. In say like say we're in C minor, this is like um, would be a good example of this. So if we're in like C minor, and we have D major, I wouldn't immediately think of it as necessarily being like um, D F sharp A. So like unless hmm. A shows up, um, I will think of the whole thing as just being like if we're talking about scale degrees, would be like one two flat three sharp four five flat six, and then depending on what happens. Um, in the top, it might be like flat seven or seven, um, or I might even think of it as like sharp six, seven, depending on how D major resolves to uh, G or progresses mm -hmm. to G. But um, I wouldn't think of it necessarily in a relation of like a scale that fits G. I would still think of it in relation to the underlying like minor mode, or as you mentioned earlier, like the minor scale. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 I don't know. I just don't. I don't think of it in terms of like rigid scales. And and I think part yeah. of that. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, it's just uh, one thing that. So this there are a couple of things that from video game music that I learned. Um, I mean, there's tons of things, but <laughs> in relation to uh, this particular uh, moment is so one thing I, I really started to notice. And once I noticed it in video game, I noticed it in a bunch of like older pieces, especially by like Chopin and and other Romantic composers, but. Mm -hmm. um, there's a in Zelda two, throughout the score you hear a lot of uh, sharp nine chords, hmm. um, and well maybe not a lot but you, you you hear them pretty pretty regularly but the way they're used is they usually pop up in uh, in minor tonalities, and um, and what he'll he'll end up doing is use like the minor seventh um, of like the underlying scale. And um, so say we're in like C again and you have uh, like G7 is he'll use and the chord accompaniment, it'll be like a G7 chord. But in the melody, you might have something like um, G, A flat, B flat, A flat, G or G hmm. leaping to B flat, walking down to, to A flat and then G. And this is another instance where like analysis versus performance and that um, I would question whether or not a chord is actually a sharp nine chord or a flat 10 chord. Right. Um, which you would, you would like, I don't think anyone <laughs> would be willing to play your music <laughs> if you dropped like a G7, uh, <laughs> flat 10 chord. Flat 10, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, like I'm slowly trying to introduce, uh, augmented sixth chord symbols of like D flat sharp six, but D flat in parentheses sharp six. Right. Um, and I feel like even that would be like forbidden. Like you would, it, you would be like, people would revolt and, and mm -hmm. not want to play it. <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, so that was like. When we think of scales, um, we think of like natural minor, harmonic minor, and melodic minor. But there's this really heavy use of an overlay of the natural minor and 
the harmonic minor. So you end up with an octatonic scale, um, mm-hmm. not in like octatonic being like the diminished scale, but just meaning eight tones. And then mm-hmm. you can have like one flat three, or sorry, one, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, seven. And, um, and, and it's not that they're used like in a, in a harmonic sense, but it's just two overlaying ideas. And, um, yeah. and that's never talked about. And it just about. gets convoluted to. Yeah. And it, it does get convoluted to think about, um, in terms of like harmony and stuff, but I, I never heard that mentioned ever. I, I don't think I've still heard it mentioned. It's just something that pops up a lot in, uh, mm-hmm. and it's usually like, it's, it's usually embellishments. Like they're, they're rarely used as chords, although there is, oh, I can't remember the tune. It's one of the, uh, in the piano collections for Final Fantasy, there's um there's a voicing that uses the flat nine and uh and the sharp nine hmm. with uh in a way that it, it kind of links into what I'm talking about where it's like uh like a minor scale with um a minor or natural minor and a harmonic minor overlapped. Um, it's really cool. If I find it, I'll try and share it with you later and then you can disperse it if you want. But uh mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there are just so many moments in, in music that don't, they just, they just aren't like pretty to talk about, but like yeah. they sound amazing and they're worth exploring, but just based on like, uh, I guess like our current set of like terminology and all that is, it just doesn't lead to like, <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense almost. It, mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't want to say breaks the rules cause I hate that term, but right, like, right, right. Um, but it it just doesn't like, we don't have a, a a very good way to talk about it yet, um, Mm -hmm. to where everyone will understand. Uh, I, I may have missed it, but can you summarize what you mean by, uh, sectional tonality? Oh, I never even got into that part. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, so so sectional tonality. So linking back, I think I understand what you mean, but linking back to it is that like a lot of times is your modulations, end up being, um, they're in some way connected to like a really, really big detour from the primary tonality as a way to emphasize that tonality. And mm-hmm. then to my understanding, the, the idea of sectional tonality is that it doesn't function in that way, that it's more so of like, you have these brief tonal centers that, that work in succession, but they mm-hmm. don't like necessarily relate in a in a like harmonically like functional manner in like a, especially not in a traditional sense. And there are articles that'll do that for like Beatles music. There's a lot of them for like Radiohead's music. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of it ends up coming down to just being like voice leading and uh, like counterpoint and, and like <clears throat> it being that you basically just end up with these like brief moments where you're, you're just like vamping on ideas and uh, a, a really good example of that would actually be like kind of funk music and yeah. that you vamp on chords for like so long that they become like their own tonal center. Right. But they're not yeah, developed I, or I anything. I was thinking or, of, right. I mean, like, uh, well, this isn't an example of, of the vamp idea, but uh, I've been thinking for a while about something that I've been calling, uh, I've been referring to as localized tonicization. Okay. uh, On the, um, OC server. And it's something that I noticed amongst a lot of rock composers primarily. Uh, but a specific, so some, some specific examples, uh, Jin Sinoe of the Sonic series, uh, Junichi Masada of the Pokemon series, uh, Matoi Sakuraba of Golden Sun, Mario Tennis, and Mario Golf, um, will write this way where you have... Um, it's If you just take the idea of a pivot chord in modulation, and then you just look at every chord as a potential pivot chord, mm-hmm. that's kind of like the idea. So for example, there's... um. There's a song by Jun Sanoe from the uh, NASCAR arcade soundtrack, and 
it's, I forget the title of the song, it's one of two songs on that soundtrack, and I always flip their titles around, but it's, um, I'm gonna have to remember, I haven't played it in a while, so, like, it starts out, uh, in the key of G, and it's, like, very clearly set there, um, but then, like, the B section, so let's see, it's like, um, it's just vamping around on G for a bit, and then it goes to C and then D. And then the B section is B flat, C, A flat, B flat, and these are all major chords. Um, D flat, E flat, F, and it's, so to repeat that, B flat, C, a flat, B flat, D flat, E flat, F. And the phrase, or that, that section ends on F in a very, uh, well, D flat, E flat, F sounds like flat six, flat seven, one at that mm -hmm. point. But then it moves up again to G uh, mm -hmm. for the return to the A section. So that whole thing, like, it's hard to fit that into a particular key, mm -hmm. but it feels as but it, it never feels as though it's not it or like one. broken or just like jarring. Like it's right. very smooth through all of it. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's certainly like going pretty far. But mm -hmm. so another example, it's a little bit shorter, maybe a little easier to to parse. Is um, there's a song from Splatoon Two called um, "Don't Slip." It's one of the uh, Turf War battle themes and. It's used for the other modes, too, but whatever. Uh, it's in the key of... Uh, well, that's debated. So <laughs> the... <laughs> so it's... I'll, I'll show it to you after after we record, after we finish recording, because it's so fascinating. It's one of the most interesting, like, pieces of music I've heard. And it's, um, it's composed by Toru Minigishi. So the... Well, okay. By the point of the B section, it's very... It sounds very clearly, I think, in D major. The progression at that point is C major 9, D add 9, E flat add 9. Okay, well, I have to be more specific. Uh, C major 9, D sus 2. E flat sus two, F sus two, over a B flat five. F is there, so I guess just F sus two over B flat, um, and that cycles. So it, it, to my ears at least, it never sounds as though it leaves the key of D, um, and you could easily look at that progression and, and assume C is the tonic, but I promise you, if you listen to it, it's <laughs> going to sound like D, um, just due to the way that it's phrased. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's like, if you think of it, and it's, maybe it's not the right idea to think of it in terms of Roman numerals, but I'm going to try to anyways. So you have flat seven. You think of that as Dorian flat seven, if you want to mm -hmm. think of it that way. Uh, like, when it comes to minor keys, the... Uh, well, I really any key, major or minor. Uh, on the flat seven chord, the seventh really doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. It can be major or minor. It, it's going to function the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's flat seven, one. And then you have the E flat and F, and it's... It's... That's a point where it's not entirely clear where it's going, and it could go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you have E flat F. It sounds because when I hear that, I think I, I think of one of two things. I think four five of B flat, or I think flat six flat seven of G, and because it's kind of setting up both of those. And and sorry to interrupt, but is that F when you say F? Is that the one with B flat in the bass? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, but another way of looking at that, just due to the way that it loops back, you have F, that's the 4 of C. B flat is the flat 7 of C. 
And so it's like it's kind of converging back to C on both ends, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of keeping this loop going. Mm-hmm. Um, because E flat, because if you think about it in terms of a typical rock progression, like ignoring the D chord for a moment, uh, E flat F C is kind of your typical rock cadence, mm-hmm. at least as far as it maybe late 70s and on rock music goes. Uh, and so, like, it's not actually tonicizing C, but it's it's one of these weird progressions that's very difficult to, uh, to pin down functionally, but mm-hmm. it's... That was, that was a very long explanation, but, like... <laughs> point is that like it's kind of traversing between keys Mm -hmm. while never exactly leaving the one that it's it's it it never feels as though it's not in a key yeah um yeah so i I guess like not having heard it which is a terrible way to to analyze me (laughs) but um the so actually Uh, hold on let me let me play it for you okay i'll just i'll get my guitar um i won't be able to play the bass note on the F chord, but whatever. Um, my guitar's out of tune, whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yeah, um, and and also too is, even though I just listened to that, uh, just for anyone out there that might think that you can look at notes on a page and avoid listening, um, even with that in my ears, I still need to hear like what precedes it to mm-hmm. uh, to know to know like what you know is is it where it's coming from. That's just yeah. As I'll send you the as, link afterwards. Yeah, I definitely want to to listen to it. And but whenever that E flat hits. To me, like that's a transition point. Yeah, and and well, to me, when I when I f- immediately heard it, I, like C major and D major were fine, like in the sense mm-hmm. of it, it's just kind of like moving a sound. But as soon as that mm-hmm. like that E flat hit, is it it felt extremely foreign, like mm-hmm. it wasn't part of it. But to my ears, is it felt like the the feeling you get when you are. Um, Actually, I, I can I can. There's a I don't know if you're familiar with um. There's a new game that's in development, that's like a, an indie game called uh, Chained Echoes. Have you by chance? I haven't heard of it. So it it recently got funded on Kickstarter, and uh, <clears throat> I've been talking to uh, one of the the composers, and I was checking out a tune he released, and it said in like, if you were gonna pinpoint modes, it'd be like uh, mostly in C Aeolian. And then at the very end, it shifts to what could be referred to as like um, to C Phrygian. So you get that um, okay. C to D flat, and uh, and when you hear it, like you hear that like that D flat chord is like very foreign to the sound, but you hear it immediately like wanting to kind of just pull back down. Um, mm-hmm. And that's like when you hit that E flat, it sounded to me like that, like it it was like a, a neighbor chord of of um, like an, a very literal like neighbor chord of of D major. And mm-hmm. then everything was just like a semitone away kind of thing, uh, wanting to just like pull back, even though like it wasn't voiced in that manner. It's it like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> is it, uh, um, it, I heard it relative to like that D and then instead of returning to it, it just pushed further away to like F mm-hmm. and then just like reset. And, yeah. uh, and I think that's also like a really important part of, uh, of like video game music, um, and just music in general is like, is like when things loop. And Mm -hmm. that not so much it's like filler information, but the progression itself doesn't have to necessarily make like a, 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 like functional journey Mm -hmm. in the sense that it's just like this idea that's continually like propelling forward partially because it's not functional in a way. And it's just like, it can go anywhere. Um, And then from there it can like burst off and mm-hmm. complete itself or, or whatever. And, uh, cause, go, cause go. when I look at it, I think of, cause I see, um, partly due to the, 
my thoughts on the chromatic scale, which you've discussed as well. Uh, I see... Well, I see every note and every chord as having... Uh, as being related to every other note and every other chord mm -hmm. in certain ways that are weaker or stronger depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, it's not the case that C and F sharp you know, major chords are not related. It's just that if you're in the key of C, well, if you're in any key, really, it's going to be harder to it's going to be hard to reconcile on them. But that's a bad example. But Wait, like, you say you say C C major and F sharp major? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's that's a bad example. It's hard to reconcile them in, in any case. But like, uh, you can come up with examples. But like the anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that like uh, I see um, virtually infinite. Uh, connections between whatever a given chord is and all the other p potential chords. And then uh, certain avenues are lit up as this progression unfolds mm -hmm. as being potential pathways for each. Yeah, and it's so, kind of like a, a choose-your-own-story kind of thing. Exactly, yes. And so as the progression goes and each chord is introduced... It's like, here are, like, so when the E flat hit, hits, like, a pathway to G lights up and a pathway to B flat lights up and to their major and minor forms. Uh, and that's just, you know, two, four examples. Uh, or to F, or, you know, they become, start to become more distant. And, or back to D. But it's, like... It's not, I think what I'm trying to say is that, like, it's not as though you can look at that progression and say that there's one way that each of these chords is functioning, mm -hmm. but that each one introduces the possibility to go in a thousand different directions, maybe two or three of which would be the most likely, and then it chooses one of them, mm -hmm. and that's just the one that it happens to choose. And so in that sense, it does have a function, but... In another sense, the function was not predefined. Yeah, and, it and was also kind of up in the air. And this is so there were, there were kind of two points that came up to mind whenever you're talking about it. is the first point is like the idea of like theory being universal, um, and that, I feel like that's something that like it took me kind of a while to to finally just come to terms with that. Um, in that a lot of theory is designed for like particular styles of music, and mm. that doesn't mean. Like you can you can expand theory to fit new styles, but sometimes it's just like this music just won't be analyzed well with this other system because it's a different system. It's almost like kind mm -hmm. of like trying to. I was talking to someone about this before about um, it's kind of like if you have like screwdrivers and you have like a Phillips versus a flathead. Um, mm. Like just because a Phillips can't work on like a, a flathead doesn't mean that the Phillips is worthless. It's designed for a particular like screw head and that's mm -hmm. what it's optimized for. But that said, sometimes a flathead can unscrew um, Phillips just because of... That's a good way of putting it. But, the, and like for me, this is like a, a... It's... It does not mean that the flathead is necessarily a better tool overall because it has somewhat more versatility because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, your Phillips is going to be like optimized for that screw head, no matter like whether or not the, the flathead can get in there and unscrew it. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of stuff that, that we try to do. We try to force systems that were designed for particular styles of music. And if it doesn't fit in there, instead of trying to find like a new answer, we're just like, Oh, it's not functional. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in this case is like what you're talking about. That's like, like a, a very interesting way to think about chord function in the sense that it, it's not so much predetermined function and that it, it has like a set like route, but that it's very like free functioning. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and I think of stuff in terms of, uh, this especially deals with like chromatic harmony when it ends up being, like, inharmonically reinterpreted. So one of the, like, prime examples being diminished seventh chords um, yeah. is that you can just, like, reinterpret their spelling, and as a result, they function differently. But say you're, like, in the, 
the tonality of C and you have like B diminished seven and it's been being used like that over and over and over. And then suddenly it's used to, to lead us into, we'll say like a, a minor, which is related Mm -hmm. to C, but nevertheless, um, when we first hear it, there's that moment where we're like, Oh, this is a B diminished seven chord. And it isn't until it moves somewhere else that we're like, Oh, it's actually a leading tone diminished of, a minor, whether it's considered a sixth chord or now a one chord or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has like dual function basically. And there's right. the function of what it, we initially hear it as and like the function of where it ends up going. And I think in like this case is like based on like what you're saying is, <clears throat> is that we end up with chords that have kind of like split functions and just whatever path is chosen is the path that's chosen kind of thing. Right. And um, I think of, of, all chords like that, you know, yeah. if you're in C and you have a G7, that has many different possible functions as well. Oh, it's yeah. just that it's more likely that you're going to have uh, a particular one. And, like, when you have chords that are outside of the key, like the E flat in this case, uh, that's when the other options start to look more likely. Yeah, um... And what's also kind of kind of interesting is like is like uh, like I don't know I, I guess like harmonic bias or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the primary examples of this being um, being what's referred to as like dominant seventh chords, and uh, I find it really interesting that in a, a lot of cases for like quote unquote non functional harmony is it's usually a dominant seventh chord being used in a way that's not like a dominant seventh, <laughs> and. Uh, and you'll end up finding like really intense, oh, like overly convoluted ways to think about. It. And I, I've done this before, so I I can mm-hmm. I can say that like you'll mm-hmm. you'll go through like so such distant, far fetched relations, and you'll be like, it's this related to this chord that's somehow related to this chord over here, but it deceptively resolves. And you're like, mm-hmm. that that we don't hear that Too <laughs> like so. Um, and part of it, I feel, is just because of what we call it. We call it a dominant seventh, and so we think mm-hmm. of it as dominant function. And that's why now I will refer to those chords as major minor seventh chords unless they have a dominant function. Hmm. Um, yeah. And the reason why is because, uh, for instance, like in a minor mode, super common to hear like um, a four seven voiced as like a major minor seventh chord, or you could think of that as like the Dorian four. Um, yeah. and it will go to like the five chord and that is not a quote unquote deceptive resolution of resolving up, a um, a whole step, but it was originally a five, seven, a flat seven or something like that. It's just a subdominant chord moving to a dominant chord. And mm-hmm. by calling it a dominant seventh, we like run the risk of it being like, some convoluted dominant chord that right. doesn't work how we expect it. And there are so many times where, especially in like the romantic period and stuff, where you'll see um, major minor seventh chords used for like voice leading purposes because they're tension. And because they are tension, um, they have the opportunity to just resolve. And as long as you go mm-hmm. from like a certain point of tension to like a lesser point, in a way, it feels like resolution. Um, right. Especially if it's happening. A, like, v- briefly, and you're just, like, passing through, like, a chain of chords. Um, mm-hmm. Or if you, um, depending on, like, the the form, like, where you are in, like, the metric design, you know, like, if you're arriving to, like, a big cadential point, then odds are you're going to fill it in, like, that dominant functioning way or whatever. But if it's just, like, a chromatic major minor seventh chord and... Um, isn't functioning a dominant chord. That doesn't mean it's non-functional. It could just be counterpoint at that at that at the moment in time, or um, it just could. It really just is voice leading. At the end of the day, it typically is voice leading. Like for instance, um, so there's one super popular example, which is like the creep progression of like uh, one three was it like one three seven to minor four. So like C major to E seven to F major to F minor. Okay. That, yeah. That Radiohead tune, um, and that people will, will be like, "Oh no, it's a five, seven of six, but it's deceptively resolving to the four mm-hmm. chord, which is the flat six of the six 
And you're like, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's really like, uh, a lot of like connections made when you could just be mm-hmm. like, oh, it's just like, um, it's just voice leading. Um, well, I mean like the way I look at that is, um, the, so the E major, uh, is, is, is it E or E7? I think it's voiced as E7. Okay. So E7, I mean, from the perspective of being a secondary dominant, that would be 5 of A minor. Mm-hmm. And so, in a sense, it would be correct to say that it is the 5 of A minor and it deceptively resolves. But mm-hmm. it's... And I, I have explained it in that way in the past, but... I have as well. It, it's... That doesn't really give a lot of information when mm-hmm. you're... Because it's like, what's really happening is that... So you have the um, G-sharp and D, which resolve to A and C. Mm-hmm. And that can be harmonized as an A minor chord, or it can be harmonized as an F major chord. And because F major contains A and C as well. Right. And so that res- it's like the tritone substitution. The inner resolution is completed, but the auxiliary notes of the chord are different. It doesn't really matter. Like, it's... F major and A minor are both... Uh, um, ways of resolving that chord Mm -hmm. in the same core manner and so it's not so much that it's that resolving to f is a you take a step at a minor and then you transform that Mm -hmm. it's that it's another possible step of the group of uh of the avenues that it could take. And mm-hmm. sure, maybe A minor is the most common because it's the best supported, but F is pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also too is like, um, like I know, and also it, it could be that I've just heard it so many times that, you know, when you hear it, it's like, it's not, I mean, it is, it's not, to me, it's not surprising. It is uplifting, but it's not surprising in the sense like you were deceived. Mm-hmm. Like it feels right. Um, right. I mean, I hear that so often anyways. Yeah. It's not a really surprise to me. Yeah. And, um, and, but what's also cool too, is when you, when you look at the progression, like the overall is you end up seeing that, uh, you have, so G, the fifth of C, you have G sharp, the third of E seven, you have a, the third of F and then you have a mm-hmm. flat, the minor third of F. So like so it's just it ends going up back and forth. Yeah, it just ends up being like voice leading at that point. It's just yeah. like G G sharp A A flat, just back and forth. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it's an elaboration of that. Yeah, and another example that. Uh, and you could use A minor to get that as well, but that it's, yeah, they don't, they don't. Yeah, and and, and it's not like are, and you feel different robbed chords, or deceived. So, it's just right. It just is what it is. You know, kind of like what you're saying with the other progression. It's just po- a ton of possibilities, and whichever one you choose. As long as you make it work, it it, it functions. Um, and uh, which I, I want to comment on on function in a moment. But uh, um, another example could be like if you're in C and you you go to like C seven over B flat and then to A minor, that could be like perceived as being um, like A. Oh, it's like oh, so it was a five seven of four. But mm-hmm. it goes to its median of four, which is the sixth chord, A minor, and that's why it works. But it could also just be like, well, it's just a descending bass line leading into to A. Like, it, it, mm-hmm. does it have to be any more than that? Um, mm-hmm. There's like, because you have the uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have a a destabilized. Uh, chord here mm-hmm. because it's first of all you have the tritone and then it's in third inversion which doesn't help it either right and that just it drags the bass backwards as hard mm-hmm. as it can and a, a semitone back to a yeah and also too is that because it's in that inversion is it and the seventh is in the bass it's expected that it falls down right just because that's the way like tendon like uh your tendencies of that sonority yeah um but it's like does it really feel like deceptive to go to A minor instead of 
of uh, mm-hmm. to to F. And another one being like um, like for instance in your like lament bases, uh, when you have like so you say you're in like C minor and you have like C B B flat A etc. Mm. All that um, it's just, it's really common to see uh, like C minor to G major to G minor, and you could have you could have all sorts of possibilities on on A like. One of my favorites is like the six half diminished, um, so like mm-hmm. a half diminished, and right, then that yeah. could go to a number of things. It could go to like a flat augmented six. That could go to you know um, just really anything, but um, but it's like did that five chord like function non functionally because it's mm. G major G minor to like a half diminished right. or whatever or is it really just a descending baseline and it's just been harmonized and what's more important is like that goal of motion that descending mm-hmm. line you know and uh and uh when i commented on or i said i want to comment on function one thing that i, I think like for me that I, I learned within the last year or two is to learn that not every chord that has a function within a key or like within a tonality is always operating under that function, even if it appears to be. So the first like level mm. of this like idea would be like um, if you have like C major, G major, back to C major, and say you're like in the first four measures of a piece, and you have so like one five back to one. Now was that really tonic dominant tonic in the sense of like you're changing areas, um, like tonal areas, or is it just that the tonic area is prolonged? by the yeah, five chord yeah. via like neighbor chord. Um, right. It's just an embellishment. And so when you look at it in that way, it's like, okay, everything is really operating with a tonic function because we're just expanding the tonic area with this extra chord. And that's not really a dominant function. And mm-hmm. I think like this is is really more of what non-functional harmony should be used used as, like that term. And yeah, that it's, I can see that. And and someone actually had I can I saw it on like I think like a writer post or something like that but they they were like so instead of thinking of non functional as you can think of non structural um, meaning that mm. like is that yeah. is that particular like chord that has an expected function is it structurally fu- like operating at that yeah moment? I see that yeah um, and I, and I think that when you start thinking of it on that level like for instance going back to your progression with uh, um, C major nine D major E flat Sus2, F sus2 over B flat, like that. Yeah. Um, is like, is that, does that need to be considered like functional? Or is that like whole progression operating on like some prolongational level kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then you also mentioned uh, like C, C major to F sharp major. Uh, funnily enough, is. Um, yeah, I would see that as probably as an embellishment of C. Yeah, and and we, I, we so in that group that I mentioned earlier, the Facebook group, um, we were talking about uh, um, Dvorak's uh, Symphony Nine, and it's the second movement. Someone posted like, "What do you think of like these opening chords?" And this actually ties into uh, to analysis versus performance scores. So the score is written in uh, D flat major, and the first chord you hear is written as E major. And then it goes to B flat major over D, and then it goes back to E major, okay. and then it goes. That's interesting. Taking advantage of the inversion. To, oh man, um, it goes. Oh, then it goes to D flat major, so E major or D flat major, and hmm. then it goes to A A major. Yeah, it goes to A major. Yeah, I see it. And then it goes to uh, to um, I think it's like F sharp minor. Sorry, it's really hard for me to think of it because I've have it I've have it uh, I've been thinking of it in a completely different way. But that's what's written in the score. And uh, so in terms of performance, that's a lot easier to read than the way I think of it as, mm-hmm. which is. Um, Actually, I have it up on. Uh, let me pull up on Twitter because I can't remember everything. But I rewrote um, the E chord as F flat major, okay. and um, and that's because when you look at it like that, you see it as like a flat three relative to D flat major, and then it goes to B flat major over D, which is um, an altered six 
relative to D flat major. But with in relation to F flat major, it's just like a chromatic tritone relationship. It's two major chords mm-hmm. that are a tritone apart. And yeah. when you hear that, um, and it goes back to F flat major, it just sounds like an expansion. Like it, it doesn't sound like mm-hmm. like there needs to be any sort of functional explanation. It's just prolonging that sound by expanding it, yeah. and then like ex- like basically like expanding it and then contracting it back in place. Um, mm-hmm. And then and this is where it's really interesting in regard to function is you have F flat major, then going to um, to D flat major. And so if you look at the score, you know that D flat major is the tonic because it's like the key signature and it ends up being the, the like when you get a quote unquote cadence, it ends up being like that uh, D flat major. And mm-hmm. but at this particular moment, you don't hear it as like tonic. And I mentioned this in the group and other people were like, yeah, I definitely do not hear it as like a like harmonically functioning as like a one as a one chord. It takes time <clears throat> to stabilize. Yeah, and it's because like you hear it. So you had F flat major to B flat major <laughs> over D, and so that was used as an expansion. Then you have <laughs> F flat major to D flat major, which is a chromatic median relationship. So again, it sounds like that romantic period expansion and then contraction. Um, mm-hmm. But what's cool here is after that D flat major, it ends up going to B double flat major, which is the flat six chord. And so then if you look back at it, you have like F flat major, D flat major to B double flat major. And so F flat major, D flat major is a chromatic median. D flat major to B double flat major is a chromatic median. But if you connect the two, so F flat to D flat is a minor third, D flat to B, mm-hmm. B double flat is a major third, that together is a fifth, you end up having like a uh, descending fifth progression of like F flat mm-hmm. major to B double flat major. And when you consider like this relationship uh, and you also think of like the metric position of everything, is like mm-hmm. F flat major is on like, uh, is the first two measures on beats one and two. And then you have uh, B flat major over D on beat three and four of measure one. And you have uh, D flat major on beat three and four of measure two. And then you have B double flat major on beat one of measure three. So if you were to just like extract those extra chords, uh, B flat major over D and um, D flat major, you just have F flat major, F flat major, B double flat major. And um, mm. so, but the, the whole point being, that's probably like really confusing to think about. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the point being is that like when you hear that one chord is like in your mind, when you're looking at the score, you might be like, oh, that's tonic function. But when you listen to it, it's not tonic function in the sense that right. it doesn't feel stable like a tonic chord. Um, it feels part of like a prolongation. And, uh, and I think that that's like a, a really kind of important concept to kind of look into and consider is that when I see a five chord or I see a four chord or anything like that, is that necessarily dominant function or is it a prolongation of something? And when Mm -hmm. you start looking at basic harmonies like that, then you can start looking at really far out chromaticism as being like, do I need to explain it functionally or is it non-functional in the sense that it's just prolonging something? It's part of a goal Mm -hmm. of emotion or it's an embellishment or something that isn't necessarily... Can I understand this in some other way? Yeah, and so that you don't feel compelled to reduce it to, like... Something a, empty. Yeah, and just, again, like, it being, like, reduced to a, a, a quote-unquote function. Like, things don't have to function in, like, tonic subdominant dominant to be logical, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's all just, I mean, really, it's just, it all comes down to, it's just, it's a tell your own story and you just have to like make those choices. And if you make it work at the end of the day, then it doesn't matter really what you did as long as you created like a coherent idea. Assuming you want it to be coherent, you could just like mm-hmm. t- t- totally abandon that if you want. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, is I don't know. I just feel like we, we get, we get really stuck on boxes and, uh, yeah. and we have to make it fit. And if we can't fit, we're just, we just like, instead of changing the way we think, we just think it doesn't work and it only works because mm-hmm. it sounds cool and there's no other explanation for it. Um, yeah. which is okay. It's okay to just accept that, you know, you don't have like, yeah, you don't have to understand everything. Yeah. Um, there are definitely still tons of moments when I look at them and I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on here, you know, and that's fine. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, it, it is what it is, but, uh, I just think that 
I think that just because, you know, you can't understand it or that maybe no one is yet able to understand or whatever, that it doesn't necessarily mean it's non-functional in the sense that there is no logic behind it. It's just that maybe we haven't right. thought of why it's logical. Um, right. So, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good stopping place for now. I would love to continue <laughs> this much longer, but um, it's been a very interesting conversation. And I'm Definitely. Glad that- I'm Definitely. glad that we had it. I do. I want to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. I was. I was honestly like super nervous about it. But uh, yeah, this is my first um, uh, <clears throat> like podcast kind of thing. <laughs> um, so uh, or live talk for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, especially since I've like graduated school. So, whew. but yeah, no, it was it was it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank Thanks. you for being a part of it. Absolutely. Where, Thank you for having me. Where can people find you? Um, so on, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, uh, you can find me there and I'll have see. links to all these. In the it's a, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Gim music theory. That's a good way. Um, I'm on Patreon. Um, yes. I'm on YouTube. Um, I have a discord channel, but it's not really active at the moment. Um, I'm actually part of your discord channel. So I, I pop up in there every now and then. Yes. Um, just because it is very, <laughs> it's very easy to lose your days in, in your channel, you know, <laughs> it's it, like, it, you know, sometimes when conversations get going, it just is like yeah. a never ending role. And, and because of just the setting, you might be going and then someone else jumps in and then it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you might, it's not one rabbit hole. It can end up being very, very yeah. many rabbit holes. Um, so sometimes I'm there, um, the rabbit holes are breeding like rabbits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, and then also on, on, on Facebook, well, I don't really have my GIM channel on Facebook, but you can find me in that channel or not channel, that group. Um, I think that covers music theory too. Yeah. Music theory too, intermediate and advanced. So, um, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me. Mm-hmm.